I invite you to hear these words from the gospel according to Matthew. When John the Baptist heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth this day and the the reflections of all of our hearts and our minds be an offering to you. May they draw us closer to you as indeed you are drawing closer to us as we continue to walk this journey and advent toward Bethlehem, toward Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray, amen. Perhaps it was true for many of you as it was for me growing up. If they wanted to, my parents could have instituted the strongest punishment for my wrongful actions. Not that I ever did anything too bad because I am the youngest child and therefore the favorite child. But on the rare occasion that I did deserve some kind of punishment, it was never as bad as when they said, We're just really disappointed in you. We get disappointed by a whole bunch of things in life. In addition to people constantly disappointing us, maybe a meal at a restaurant was underwhelming or a long-anticipated movie fell short of expectations. Maybe a book or a, a music album didn't live up to the hype. Our favorite sports teams have a way of disappointing us often. I expected more of Cadillac Ranch in Amarillo, Texas. You know, that public art installation consisting of 10 graffiti-encrusted junk Cadillacs, half buried, nose first in the ground, apparently at an angle corresponding to that great pyramid Giza in Egypt. Well, guess what? It's a bunch of old Cadillacs, half buried in a dirt pasture. Disappointing. Perhaps you've been to the Louvre in Paris and seen how small the Mona Lisa is. Still a remarkable piece of of art, but I thought it would be much larger. Or the Christmas tree at Rockefeller Center in New York City, not nearly as tall as they make it look with those TV camera angles. We've all felt disappointed in some way. Somebody in the kitchen or behind the camera or in the studio lets you down, leaving your high-flying expectations a mess. Our friend, John the Baptist, knew all about disappointment. You thought you were done with him, this freaky guy in the wilderness, having our fill last Sunday, but, but he's still hanging around. But he's in prison now. 
and he's looking for a sign. A sign that the long-awaited Messiah has really, truly arrived. John the Baptist is the one who first proclaimed the coming of the Messiah, but a lot has happened since then, and now he's teetering on disappointment. He's also got a very big question. They say there's no such thing as a stupid question, but many of us have experienced otherwise. When asking a question, we were either greeted with silence or strange looks or laughter. And it's a relief, is it not, when someone else asks the question that you wanted to ask, but you're too afraid to do so. Well, here, someone else asks Jesus our question. Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for someone else? It's a dangerous question. It's essentially, is Jesus the real deal? And we are probably kidding ourselves if we have never claimed to have asked this question in some way, even in the, the back corners of our minds or hearts. And we don't want our hands in the air when someone assumes that persons of, of real faith or spiritual depth never ask anything like this. But John puts his hand in the air. And he is supposedly the smart kid in class. John is the one who said wonderful things about Jesus. You remember, he said, one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He said, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He said, he must increase, I must decrease. John had the answers. He had the the prophetic clarity that told him that Jesus was the real deal. And so what happened that he would ask, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? Disappointment. That's what happened. The very man who had attracted a flurry of attention because of his no-holds-barred announcements of a new world order that was just around the corner, this one, this this fiery preacher who shook up everything and everyone with his blazing rhetoric about a new kingdom coming. This wilderness guy wearing a camel outfit and dipping locusts in wild honey while dunking people in the river is now in prison because he ruffled the feathers of the powerful guys who were in charge. He said that he had come to baptize with water, but the one following him would baptize with fire from heaven. So where was the fire? So far, there wasn't even any smoke. So now, John's in prison, where he has nothing but time to think. And he is being tormented by a question. But the person he has a question for hasn't visited. So John dispatches a crew of his friends to track him down. And they confront Jesus with the question, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? It's a question with disappointment and letdown written all over it. It had to hurt to ask it. Did we mistake the message or the messenger? John is asking. John just baptized Jesus about eight chapters ago. And he became confused and disappointed about the way in which Jesus was living out his Messiahship. And here's the thing about disappointment, friends. It is an unavoidable part of being human. It is physiological, not just emotional. Our brains generate expectations for the future. So when we don't get what we expect or need, our dopamine levels plummet. Instead of receiving a double shot of dopamine when our expectations are met, we receive no dopamine when disappointment happens. And John spent all of his life pointing to Jesus with so many expectations, but it felt like he still hadn't found what he was looking for. And Jesus' response to this interrogation of sorts is to tell John's disciples to tell John what they had seen and heard out in the wilderness. Some blind people can now see. 
A few of the lame can now walk. Some deaf people now hear. Bodies are being made whole. Genuine good news is being preached. Everyone has a place at the table. A new way of being human is emerging. The new order seems to be spreading, but it's spreading in small ways, perhaps. But it was all good. Nothing to worry about here, Jesus says. So if John is going to believe that that Jesus was the one, he would probably have to do it the hard way, by believing what other people report about Jesus. More importantly, though, John would have to let go of his preconceived expectations of how this Jesus was going to do things, how he was going to live out his messiahship. And I wonder, maybe John's state of mind is more similar to ours than we care to admit. Isn't it easier to believe in God when things are going well, when things unfold how we expect them to? But when disappointment is waving in your face as it did for John, when the world is piling up on you, or when you have received wrong messages about about God not wanting any part of life with you, and you've been beat up by rules and judgment, it's no wonder that anyone could ask, Jesus, are you really the one who is going to make all this right? Or should I look for plan B? Matthew's entire gospel account is the answer to John's question. Yes, he is the one. God really is up to something in Jesus, up to something really big. Jesus, if you notice, asked the crowd three times what they had gone to see when they sought John in the wilderness. And as we blaze through Advent every year, I wonder, what do you expect to see? What do you come to see? Is it memories of Christmas's past? Is it the festive nature of the season Maybe the season comes with some dread, so you hope it passes by quickly so you don't have to see anything. But friends, we return to face the mystery of this every year because in there is an invitation to see that we are part of something so much bigger than ourselves. The story of love coming to us in the one named Jesus, has not changed. It will not change. We do not have to wait for another or a different way. He is with us and has always been with us. He is the one who says and keeps saying, come, follow me. He is the one who says, come unto me and I will give you rest. He is the one who says, come, and see. Come and see.